Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevo. Today we're going to be discussing burns. Before we actually continue with this video, for the individuals that watch this channel that may not be used to these graphical images, please, I do warn you in advance. So burns are pretty much a type of coagulative necrosis that is going to be affecting uh, the skin as well as other tissues associated with the skin or tissues underlying the skin they're going to be pretty much caused by flames they could be caused by friction they could be caused by radiation electrical current they could be caused by chemicals such as acids and alkalis they could also be caused by heat remember the skin is pretty much going to be divided into three histological layers an epidermis that consists of five layers if you're talking about thick skin Thick skin is the skin that you're going to be finding on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. It's going to consist of five layers. Then the thin skin, which is found on everywhere else on the body, is pretty much going to be covered by four layers. So the layers of the epidermis are going to be as follows. You're going to have the basal layer, which is referred to as the stratum basale. This is going to be containing the stem cells that are going to be replenishing the keratinocytes that make up the epidermis. Then the next layer is known as the stratum spinosum. It's because as you pull the cells apart, there are some cytoplasmic extensions ranging from one cell to another that look like spines. That's why it's referred to as the stratum spinosum. Then you have the stratum granulosum which has pretty much these granules that develop then you have the stratum lucidum which is a clear layer which is only found in thick skin and it's not found in thin skin and of course you have your stratum corneum now to remember these layers of the epidermis just remember the mnemonic black shoes go looking clean black for stratum basale shoes for stratum spinosum go for stratum granulosum look for stratum lucidum uh, clean for stratum conium and then also recall that the stratum basale and the stratum spinosum are pretty much referred to as the malpigian layer then underneath this epidermis you have the dermis so this dermis is going to be divided into two parts an upper part which is known as the papillary dermis because it has this finger like projections um, which is are going to be adjoining with the epidermis and the lower part is known as a reticular dermis which has this reticular like uh, network then the dermis is pretty much going to have these blood vessels it's going to have these nerves it's going to have connective tissue this is very important for you to know because when we start discussing about the different layers of the skin and the different types of burns they'll be based on these layers then of course there's a subcutaneous tissue or hypodermis which pretty much contains adipose here's a picture comparing um, thick skin which is hairless versus thin skin which contains hair so as you can see we have the epidermis here with the five layers you have your dermal epidermal junction you have your superficial papillary dermis you have the reticular dermis which is much more deep you have some sensory receptors such as the mesnius corpuscles you have some sweat ducts over there you have some blood vessels also also over there you have um nerves as well then you have the subcutaneous tissue uh, and then on the other side here you have thin skin um, which has the same layers aside probably the stratum lucidum in the epidermis you have the pilosebaceous apparatus which is this sebaceous gland and you have this hair follicle over there now remember that burns affect different age groups and these different age groups are affected differently by different types of burns uh, beginning with the commonly affected age groups being the children so most children are going to have what are known as scalds so scalds is just simply um getting your skin burnt by a hot liquid pouring over your skin so it could be from a kettle it could be from a pan it could be from hot drinks it could be from even a hot bath and the majority of the burns in the children are going to be scalds then the majority of burns that you're going to see in adolescence because as adolescents it's a it's a time where people want to be spontaneous a time where people want to be rebellious and they tend to experiment a lot so most of the burns are due to experimenting with matchsticks or even flammable liquids then in adults scalds are not so common um, but they are actually less frequent than uh, flame burns but what we get mostly in, in adults are electrical burns as well as um, chemical injuries depending on where the individual is working or in under what circumstances are they burned in 
Many things can actually cause burns to happen. So we'll begin by discussing each of the etiologies um, in about three slides or so. So we'll begin with thermal types of burns or burns that are due to heat. So like I told you, the most uh, important in children are the scolds, which are accounting for 70% of the types of burns. So this is a sli simply spilling a hot liquid on over your skin. So these burns can actually range from superficial to dermal burns, meaning that they can affect the, super, um, the epidermis, the superficial part of the epidermis, or they could extend to the dermis. Now, it's very important to know what kind of fluid this child has been burnt with. So I'll pose the question to you, the viewers, and actually ask you this, and I'll, I'd want you to pause the video at this time and actually think about it and then give me your answer, then I'll answer the question. So why do you think it's important to ask if a liquid was actually, for example, plain water or if it had milk? If you say because of the difference in boiling points, then you're indeed correct. So for example, if you have plain water which boils at a 100 degrees Celsius, that's pure water. And if you add impurities to that water, suppose we add milk to that water, or suppose we add sugar to that water and we keep boiling it, then the boiling point tends to increase. Because remember, impurities tend to increase the um, boiling point of um, water that's why it's very important and then when you get these cold burns in children for example you should also think whether there's some possible child abuse or child neglect that may have been present because if child abuse is present it should be reported to the relevant authorities so for example if you get a child whose burn patterns are not really consistent with the history that is being given by the mother like for example if the child's legs and buttocks are burnt in a circumferential way to signify as if the mother took the child and dumped uh, the child in a hot um, or boiling water then you will suspect that there's some child abuse there and please investigate this further because it's uh, very critical for this child for the survival of this child then in the much older individuals in the adults about 50 percent of the burns are usually flame burns so these are going to be associated with fire and they may be associated with inhalational injury which we shall talk a bit later on and there may be other trauma as well and um they, these tend to be dermal burns or full thickness burns so you'll understand what full thickness burns is very soon then you may get some contact burns, which is simply just touching a hot object. These are very common in epileptics because if someone gets into a seizure, they fall just about anywhere and they may fall onto a stove, they may fall onto a hot object. It's very common also in alcoholics and drug abusers because of that impaired um, judgment. Then we also see it in elderly and these burns also tend to be dermal or full thickness burns. Then you may also get what are known as flash burns. These are going to be due to exposure of natural gases, exposure to alcohol and other combustible liquids. Then cold can actually also cause burns. So you may get what is known as frostbite, which may actually present to you as a burn. Then sunburn also is very common, I'm sure one or two of you may have been sunburnt at a point they usually tend to be superficial and they are very painful so always put on sunscreen before you leave the house then another type of burn could be due to electrical injury so it could be electrical burns now these are very important because they always are deeper and they are actually much worse than they look so it may look like it's a superficial wound but it's actually deeper than it actually looks so some electrical burns may actually escalate to the point of you having to debride the wound massively or even at um, some cases amputate uh, limbs away so if someone is electrocuted and the voltage that they electrocuted with is below 1000 volts or less than one kilovolt usually there's going to be some deep contact burns at the entry point of the current and the exit point of the current now if they are electrocuted with a voltage that is greater than 1000 volts or 1000 kilovolts then you refer to that as a true high voltage electrocution and then usually this current is going to be passing through the different tissues, there's going to be extensive necrosis that's going to be there. There's going to be um, bone necrosis, many tissues are going to be injured. Then sometimes an individual could be experiencing these flash high voltage burns where the current doesn't really pass through the body, but only flashes 
past the body so it generates a lot of heat this is very common especially with um, people that have been struck by lightning sometimes they may be thrown and have secondary fractures or secondary injuries but usually the heat is what causes the the burns to the exposed areas like the face as well as the hands and what is very important about electrical injuries is because the electrical injury is going to result in damage of the muscles so there's going to be rhabdomyolysis and remember muscles are going to be holding myoglobin this myoglobin can be released into the blood. You refer to that as myoglobinemia. And some of this myoglobin is going to be filtered out in the kidneys. You refer to that as myoglobinuria. And or myoglobin or hemoglobin is very toxic to the kidneys. So it's going to be causing renal failure. So in these patients that come in with electrical burns, please make sure that you give them plenty of fluids. Please make sure that you institute some osmotic, osmotic diuretics such as manitol. You may also want to alkalinize the urine. They may also experience some orthopedic injuries like I told you and they need ECG monitoring because the heart has its electricity passing through. So if you get this large current that's passing through the heart, sometimes you may get some arrhythmias and this person may need an ECG monitoring. Certain chemicals may also cause burns. They could be acids or alkalis. Now, if I were to ask you which is worse, the alkali is actually much worse than the acids. The reason why the alkali are worse is because they cause liquefaction of the tissues. So they tend to be much deeper than the acids. And please, whenever you are experiencing chemical burns, do not at any point attempt to neutralize whatever you are trying um, to neutralize. If you are bent by an acid, then you think, okay, let me get something that's a base to neutralize it. Please do not. You're going to create further problems for yourself. So the best you could actually do is just irrigate the area as soon as possible because these burns tend to be very deep. Do not neutralize them. Do not try to be a chemist. Then there may be some ionizing radiation burns or even some friction burns that may cause. So those are some of the etiologies that we have with different types of burns. Now, an important type of burn that you need to be wary of is what is known as a respiratory burn or injury or inhalational injury. So this usually occurs to an individual that's actually burnt in an enclosed space. Suppose you're locked in a room or you're sleeping at night and the building catches fire or you're in a car driving a car and the car catches fire or you're in a plane and the plane catches fire. Then once you're burning in this enclosed area or this enclosed space, then you inhale this smoke. Now remember that um, whenever you have incomplete combustion. One product of incomplete combustion is going to be carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide has a greater affinity for oxygen, uh, for, for hemoglobin than hemoglobin having it for oxygen. So meaning that carbon monoxide will bind to hemoglobin 204 times more than oxygen binds to hemoglobin. And whenever carbon monoxide binds to this hemoglobin, it forms a very stable compound which is referred to as carboxyhemoglobin. Now this carboxyhemoglobin is very stable and it doesn't have an affinity for oxygen, so it reduces the oxygen carrying capacity and you can already see where this is going. So remember that if you get a patient that comes in and you see that they have burns around the mouth, they have this black material in their throat, sometimes burnt nasal hair, the black material in their throat as well as inside the mouth is known as soot. Um, this is supposed to be S-O-O-T then they may even have some changes in their voice. They may have strider. So all these are going to be clues that are suggestive that they may have inhalational injury. You can only confirm this actually um, by doing a fiber optic bronchoscopy, but it's not in all settings that we may have a fiber optic bronchoscopy. So we'd actually even do arterial blood gases. But again, I haven't seen them being done routinely at every single hospital. So if you do not have these facilities, just use your history to determine whether this person needs oxygen or they do not but most of the cases they will need oxygen so when you're managing these patients with respiratory burns you would want to um, intubate them preferably you want to uh, monitor the carbon um, uh, carboxyhemoglobin levels you also want to give them 100% oxygen for 24 hours because this tends to shorten the half-life of carboxyhemoglobin now burns usually have a certain effect on the body both local effects as well as systemic effects we'll have a separate lecture uh, a separate review video on the systemic effect of burns because i feel that's a much whole topic on its own but in this lecture we'll look at the local effects so there's something that is referred to as the jackson's zones of a burn so 
Jackson discussed or described these zones as the zone of coagulation, which is found in the center. This is outlined by a zone of stasis, and then you have a zone of hyperemia. So in this zone of coagulation, this is where you're going to be having the maximum point of damage, the maximum point of um, irreversible tissue loss, there's going to be coagulation of proteins. So this area here cannot be saved whatsoever. Then the zone that is just outside there is known as the zone of stasis. So here there's going to be a decrease in this tissue perfusion that may be there. And if you actually improve the circulation, you may save this um, area. Or if the problem still persists, it can actually be converted into a zone of coagulation. So you may actually um, convert it to a complete loss uh, if you have, for example, hypotension, if there's an infection, or even if there's edema. Then the outermost part is known as the zone of hyperemia. This is, of course, going to increase tissue perfusion or because of vasodilation that is there, and eventually this zone will recover. So remember that this the burns are actually not viewed as a one d type of thing they are more 3d so as you can see with the superficial it's extending into the uh, epidermis and partly into the dermis and then with the deep uh, or the mid dermal they're extending even much further into the uh, subcutaneous past the dermis so it's a 3d kind of image then remember that the effects of burns are only going to be seen when someone has been burnt with, with over 30% of their body surface area being affected. And most of these um, effects are pretty much going to be due to either activation or release of various complement factors, things like histamine, things like prostaglandins that can actually decrease the myocardial um, function. They can actually cause edema, there's going to be increase in capillary permeability, there's going to be vasodilatation, peripheral pooling of blood, even just injury to the endothelium and the red blood cells because of the heat that may be there or whatever may be causing the burn. There is also going to be, of course, reduced capacity to synthesize immunoglobulins. At the same time, the body is put into this metabolic um, stress where you're going to release a lot of these catecholamines. There will be increase in uh, fat breakdown and um, a lot of amino acids such as glutamine as well as alanine can be released from the skeletal muscle into the blood. So will the production of urea because urea is gotten from the breakdown of proteins. And because a lot of proteins are being broken down in this state, you're going to be having a lot of urea. But most of the other systemic effects we're going to cover in the next surgery video on the pathophysiology and the systemic effects of burns. The clinical features that we may see of burns patients include them having a history of burns, obviously. There may be some pain depending on the type of burns. This, the rule of thumb is this, the more pain there is, the more superficial the burn is. So the superficial burns are very painful because the nerves are still intact, while as the deep burns are not so painful because the nerves have been damaged. So the absence of pain doesn't mean that it's better, it actually means that it's worse. So of course, this, the person may be burning, they may be in an anxious state, they may have tachycardia because of the compensatory effect due to the hypovolemia. Already their skin, which is a barrier to water loss, has been lost. And there's a systemic inflammatory response syndrome that's leading to pooling of blood in the periphery, so their heart is going to be racing. They may have tachypnea, which is an increase in respiratory rate. And of course, they'll have fluid loss because of the same reasons. The vasodilatation due to the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, the increase in vascular permeability and peripheral pooling of blood, and of course, loss of water through the skin because the barrier has been lost. Now, we generally classify burns based on the thickness of the skin that is involved. We also classify burns based on the percentage of the body surface area as well as the severity, which we shall look at very shortly. So recall that I told you that the, epi the, the skin pretty much has three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous. So there are two systems that we use, an older system which uses degrees, but that's not commonly used now, and the newer system that uses um, the depth. So long ago, you had a, a first degree burn, second degree burn, third degree burns, and I, I, I presume even fourth degree burns, but most people don't usually survive from this. So with the first degree burns, these are going to be affecting the epidermis alone. The second degree burns are going to be affecting the epidermis and the dermis. Then the third degree are going to be affecting the epidermis, the dermis, as well as the subcutaneous. And then with the fourth degree, they also affect the muscles, they affect the bones. But don't worry about the fourth degree type because most patients won't really survive. 
Then the newer system now classifies it based on the depth. So you have the superficial burns, which were previously known as the first degree. You have the dermal burns, which were previously known as the second degree. And on the dermal burns, it can affect the superficial part of the dermis. So you call those as superficial dermal burns, or you call them as superficial partial thickness burns. Then you have the deep dermal burns, which are also referred to as a deep partial thickness burns. And of course, the full thickness burns, which are also referred to as the third degree type of burns. Beginning with the superficial thickness type of burns. So as you can see, we have a patient here on the right who has the superficial burns. So this was previously referred to as the first degree burn. It's only going to be affecting the epidermis. And remember, I told you that the nerves are intact because the nerves are found in the dermis. So if the nerves are intact, these tend to be very painful and they tend to appear red. They are no blisters. Most of these heal very quickly, so within a week, so about five to seven days, they'll, week, they'll heal. They won't uh, form any scar because you won't have injured the basal layer. So as long as the basal layer remains intact, it means that cells can actually regenerate. The stratum basale can regenerate the epithelium. So they're going to heal by epithelialization without any scar formation, and usually the skin peels. Now, if you uh, prick the skin of an individual with a superficial burn, like for example, a non-blistering sunburn, it tends to be painful. You refer to that as a positive uh, um, pinprick test. Now these are going to be able to help us distinguish between the superficial burn from the deep burns. The deep burns you won't get, uh, the deeper burns you won't get any pain. You may get some sensation with the second degree like as if something is touching the skin but not really pain and then with um, the third degree you won't feel anything at all. No pain, no sensation. Then with the dermal burns, remember these are divided into two types. You have the superficial dermal burns or superficial uh, partial thickness and the deep dermal burns or the deep partial thickness burns. So the superficial dermal burns are going to be affecting the epidermis and the upper part of the dermis or the papillary dermis. While it's the deep dermal burns are going to be affecting the epidermis, the papillary part of the dermis and the reticular dermis. So the upper and lower parts of the dermis. So generally the area is going to be mottled, it's going to be red, and it's going to be painful. The hallmark of these dermal burns is that they tend to blister. So if you see some blistering that's going on, then these are dermal burns. So with the superficial dermal burns, these usually, like I say, they tend to blister, as you can see in this image on the right, and they tend to blanch with pressure. So what is blanching is if you apply pressure to an area that is appearing red, for example, this area here, and we apply pressure, it becomes white. Then once we relieve that pressure, it becomes red again. So you call that property of that area of skin becoming white under pressure, you refer to that as blanching with an L, not with an R. So blanching, B-L-A-N-C-H. Then these burns tend to be really moist. They, when you, the blister is actually denuded, it can actually be pink underneath and they tend to be very painful, again, because the nerves are still intact. So these blisters, uh, these burns are going to be healing uh, and they're going to pigment in about two to three weeks, so about 14 to 21 days. With the deep dermal burns, these tend to be yellow or white in color. They may be deep red uh, under the blister because of the vasodilatation that may be there, or sometimes you may get these red dots um, it, on a white background. Those red dots just simply uh, signify the blood vessels. Then there's less blanching that is with the deep dermal burns, there is less blistering. You may get some sensory changes that are actually present. You can perceive this type of burns. Then generally they are fairly dry as compared to the superficial partial burns. And they heal in about three to eight weeks by epithelialization. They tend to pigment. Some may actually form contractures, which is pretty much fibrosis, and they may scar. With the full thickness burns, these are going to be affecting the epidermis, they're going to be affecting the dermis, they're going to be affecting the subcutaneous tissue. Now, the affected area may sometimes be charred, so it will appear dark, um, like this image here at the bottom. They tend to be painless because you've damaged the nerves inside the dermis, so they tend to be painless. So even when you prick, the the patient won't get any pain and the skin tends to be insensitive there may be sometimes some thrombosis that may be seen in the superficial vessels as we can see in this picture above then usually the wounds are going to be appearing stiff they may be white or brownish and they'll actually have this leather like texture when you feel this type of burns and there's no blanching that's there and remember these burns are painless there's no blistering and they are painless then sometimes you may get this 
um, charred, denatured, as well as insensitive, um, sometimes even contracted full thickness burns that is affecting usually the limbs. You refer to that as ESCA. And then these burns usually take a very long time to heal. So they take some months and they may actually incompletely heal and require skin grafting. Here's a table to summarize everything that we have been talking about. So we have the superficial um, burns or the first degree affecting the epidermis. They are red and they do not blister. They usually tend to be dry. They are painful because the nerves are still intact. They heal in about a week's time and they're going to heal very well. And um, again, with repeated sunburns, for example, you put yourself at a risk of developing skin cancer later on in life. So please put on some sunscreen. Then the superficial partial thickness also referred to the second degree burns these are going to be extending uh, beyond the epidermis going into the superficial part of the dermis pretty much the papillary dermis they're going to be red and they're going to have a clear blister which usually they, they blanch with pressure they are going to be moist they are very painful as well they heal in about two to three weeks then they may complicate into cellulitis but there's no scarring that's there typically so they don't form any scars here then with a deep partial thickness burns which is also a type of second degree burn these are going to be extending to the deep reticularis uh, reticular dermis and they tend to be yellow or white there is less blanching and um, there may be some blistering um, they're fairly dry and these ones you just have the pressure and discomfort there's no pain because some nerves have been damaged then of course they heal in about three to eight weeks they may have some scarring sometimes even some contractures that you may actually need to excise or even perform some skin grafts then of course the full thickness burns usually usually tend to extend to the entire dermis they tend to be stiff so they'll have this leather like texture they will be white or brown there's no blanching there are no blisters they tend to be painless because the nerves are totally damaged they may they take long to heal so it's prolonged sometimes it may be incomplete there may be some scarring contractures and amputations may actually be done and then the fourth degree of course is involving the fats the muscles and the bones so it may appear black charred with eskers you may have a dry texture and they are painless of course they may require excision so they, these ones do not heal and of course you may get amputation and usually the significant impairment and in most cases patients actually die from this type of burns here is um, a way to actually distinguish between superficial burns uh, dermal burns as well as full thickness burns you do what is known as a, a pinprick test so you simply get a 21g needle and you simply prick this patient so when you prick this person so please don't go around pricking people this is just like an academic type of exercise but when you prick this individual if it's a superficial burn then you're gonna have some brisk bleeding on the superficial uh, prick and they will be painful if it's a superficial partial just like with the superficial you have brisk bleeding on the superficial prick and some pain with the deep partial there will be delayed bleeding on the deeper prick and the pain can be felt but there's no pain then with full thickness there's no bleeding there's actually no sensation from the pain then of course the appearances usually also tend to differ the superficial ones tend to be red they glisten and they often blanch the superficial partial are red they blanch and they have clear blisters the deep partial are pale either yellow or white they are much dry there is less blanching and there's less blistering then the full thickness burns of course are going to be dry leathery and they are hard wounds so sometimes a burn can affect an entire extremity so when it affects this entire extremity it may actually cut off the blood supply because of a lot of edema that is happening in that area from this esker so you may actually complicate into this limb increasing intracompartmental pressure and leading to compartment syndrome if it's the circumferential burns are actually affecting the chest it may actually cause some breathing problems so this may actually result in um some respiratory embarrassment so you may need to perform some escarotomies which is simply just cutting into these eskers to actually provide that immediate relief now how we classify burns according to severity so what we've been talking about up to this point was about classifying burns according to um, the thickness of the skin that is involved now when we classify burns according to severity we look at the body surface area as to which this uh, burns are affecting now i'll show you how to calculate the body surface area a bit later on but for now just keep these values at the back of your head
So you have mild type of burns, moderate as well as severe. This is very important because it will help you with your admission criteria. So with the mild type of burns, you have a second degree burn, which is less than 10% in adults or less than 5% in children, or you could have a full thickness burn or a third degree burn less than 2% in either adults or children. And these ones usually can be treated on outpatient basis. So you do not need to admit this patients because of course the words would be full of people with burns if we admitted everyone that had a mild burn. Then with moderate burns, these ones usually tend to be second degree burns, 10 to 20% in adults or five to 10% in children, or you could have a, th a third degree or full thickness burn two to five percent in either adult or children and remember these burns shouldn't involve the face they shouldn't involve the eyes they shouldn't involve the perineum they shouldn't involve any joint they shouldn't involve the feet they shouldn't involve the hands if they do then they are not considered as moderate burns but they are rather considered as severe burns so if they involve any of these areas you don't call them as a moderate burn you classify it as a severe burns and of course, with severe burns, the second degree affecting greater than 20% in adults, affecting greater than 10% in children, that's a second degree burn, is considered as severe. Then of course, a third degree greater than 5%. Then if a burn is actually involving the eyes, if it's involving the ears, it's involving the feet, if it's involving the joints, it's involving the hands or the perineum, it's considered as a severe burn. And all inhalational burns or electrical burns, even burns that are associated with fractures or any other significant uh, mechanical trauma, you consider them as severe burns. Both moderate and severe burns, you would want to admit the patient. So you admit the patient with moderate and severe burns. Here's a table to summarize what I've been talking about. So here we have the minor or the mild type of burns. So partial thickness, less than 10% in adults. Uh, in children, less than 5% in both adults and children, full thickness, less than 2%. Then with the moderate type, with second degree, 10 to 20%. In adults, in children, 5 to 10%, and in both adults and children, 2 to 5% for thickness. And um, this could be high voltage injuries, there could be possible inhalational injury, there could be circumferential burns, or other health problems. Then, of course, for the major uh, or the um, severe type of burns, these are greater than 20% second degree in adults, greater than 10% second degree in children, or greater than 5% for thickness in both adults and children. Then any high voltage burn, any known inhalational injury, any significant burn, for example, to the joints, to the face, to the perineum, to the hands and the feet, or any other associated injury, that's going to be considered as a severe burn. Moving on to the last part, how do we exactly determine this percentage body surface? So there's something that's known as a Wallace's rule of nines, okay? And there's also a rule of sevens that can actually be used um, in younger individuals, in children. But typically, the rule of nines should be used in adults. But in some hospitals, we shall not mention any names here, they do use the rule of nines in children. So this here on the left is the rule of nines. So we have each body part being represented by a percentage. And all the percentages are supposed to add up to 100. So in the rule of nine, the head is going to the head and the neck is going to represent nine percent so the the front of the the face the back of the head everything is going to represent nine percent then the upper limbs each is going to represent nine percent nine percent so meaning nine four point five in front four point five at the back same thing with the face four point five here in front four point five at the back um same thing with this limb so nine percent for each limb then with the trunk in front you can divide the trunk in halves so the trunk can be divided in half here at the umbilicus. So you have the upper trunk and the lower trunk. So the upper trunk is going to be accounting for 9% in front. The lower trunk will be 9%. So in front, you would have 18%. At the back, the same thing. 9% on top, 9% at the bottom. That gives you 18% in front, 18% at the back. Then the lower limbs are each given 18%. So 9% in front, 9% at the back, 9% in front, 9% at the back. Then the perineum is going to be accounting for 1%. So if you add all these percentages, they should give you 100. Now, this is going to be an estimate when the patient comes in. Suppose they burn half of their front right leg in their entire arm. So what percentage would that be? I'll give you some time to actually think about it and then I'll give you the answer.
okay so i said in the scenario in the example you say half of the lower limb in front and the entire upper limb so half of the lower limb so remember that the lower limb nine percent in front and nine percent at the back so half of nine percent is 4.5 so you would say 4.5 plus the whole upper limb half of the upper or the whole upper limb being affected is a nine so nine plus 4.5 it means that the percentage surface area would be 13.5 percent that's how we come up with these percentages then you also have a rule of sevens where the head and neck is going to be representing 28%. The upper limbs will be 7% each. So um, 3.5, 3.5 at the front and at the back respectively. Then the front of the trunk, the upper trunk, 7%. The lower trunk, 7% giving you 14%. The same thing at the back with the lower limbs, 14% each and the perineum accounting for 2%. So the same way in which we calculate these percentages is the same way in which we can calculate these percentages using the rule of sevens. Alternatively, to estimate the body percentage surface area, we may use the rule of yeah. palms. So the patient may actually, if you get the palm of the individual, not the fingers, but the palm, the palm is going to be accounting for about 1% of the entire um, surface area. And in males, it's actually much larger. So it's about 0.8% of the total body surface area or 0.6. But people usually don't tend to remember these minute values. So that's how we usually stick to 1%. So this rule can actually be used only if the burn is less than 15% because you can as easily estimate it if the burns are very large it's very inaccurate so you can only use this if the patient's burns are less than 15 percent or if they have affected a much larger surface area more than 85 percent such that you count the healthy skin or the unburned skin now for the large burns like i already told you it's a very inaccurate method of assessing this and so what we usually do is you cut a clean piece of paper or tracing of the the person's uh, in the size of the person's hand then of course you use that to measure the percentage of the body surface area that is affected then the last way in which we can actually determine the body surface area and actually the most reliable way or the most accurate way of measuring this is with the London Broder charts so these London Broder charts um, what you need to notice like when you're estimating the percentage surface area please make sure that you ignore any erythema that may be there and of course you're going to be shading in a specific way so you shade with lines like that to signify superficial burns with crosses to signify deep burns and of course you have the different ages and what they represent so half of the half of the head in someone who's age zero would be 9.5 percent uh, at one year it would be 8.5 at five years it would be 6.5 percent so on and so forth then of course you um, use that and of course you'll be um, shading all on these diagrams and then entering the values here then of course add them here and then you have your total percentage so suppose you're on a ward round and your consultant actually gives you a call and asks you about the burns patients that you have admitted and just wants to know three things about each of the patients the three things that you would actually that are very important to consider in each burns patient number one is the percentage estimate um, of the burns because this is very important because it helps you with the admission criteria it helps you with the fluid calculation that we're going to do later on the second thing that uh, you're going to be looking at is the cause of the burn because this is going to give you an indication of how deep this burn is if it's a domestic burn usually it tends to be superficial if it's an industrial burn these tend to be uh, deep then the time of which this person was burnt because this will help you with how you're going to institute your fluid therapy especially your replacement fluids the differential diagnosis for burns just remember necrotizing fasciitis for the sake of your exam when you're assessing a patient with burns you first want to take a history so some important points that you're going to be taking on your history is of course the time and the mechanism of the injury what type of burn it is if it's a scald type of injury was it just plain water was it milk if it was water what was added to the water was it boiling and for how long was it boiling if it's an electrical injury is it a high voltage injury is it a low voltage injury or is it um, 
a flash injury was it was this person how long did they have contact with this electricity if it's a chemical injury was it an acid was it an alkali uh, if this person was actually set on fire how long was the person alight for um how was the person put out what first aid was actually done for this patient if they were cooled uh how was it done with what did you cool this person with and for how long did you cool them for because if you cool burns patients even though it's first aid if you do it for too long you may tip them into hypothermia which will create another problem and of course you will also assess if there's likelihood of any concomitant injuries or any associated injuries for example if someone fell off um, from a very high place or they were involved in an rta and the car caught on fire or they were involved in an explosion then you also assess if there's any inhalational injury like i told you earlier on where they burnt in an enclosed space um, then if there's any um, suspicion of any non-accidental injury in the cases of child abuse like i already told you some investigations that you may order you want to do a complete blood count or a full blood count of course you're going to be looking at your level of your platelets you're going to be looking at your level of your um, rbc because some red blood cells are going to be hemolyzed uh, with the burn itself and um, you're also going to be looking at the white blood cell count because the barrier of the skin has been gone so infections can actually set in you want to do a, um, a blood cross match you want to save some blood because this person may actually need a blood transfusion depending on the level of the hp you want to check um the yeah, renal function so you want to do your urea you want to do your electrolytes you want to do your creatinine you want to do um, your liver function test and of course you're also going to do your pus swab now for the patients that have electrical burns you want to do your 12 lead ecg continuously monitor these because they have risk of developing arrhythmias you want to do your cardiac enzymes and for inhalational burns you want to do your arterial blood gases you also want to do your chest x-ray now when it comes to the management of the burns patient this is just first aid management for in case where you are you come across a situation where someone is burning so please make sure that you stop them burning and you keep them away from the burning area and at all costs please do not put yourself in danger because there's no use of getting two people injured when only one person would have been helped in a different way so please don't put yourself under any danger if the person is being cooled at least make sure that you use some tap water to irrigate the area please do not exceed 20 minutes and make sure that the water is not too cold because you can tip this person into hypothermia and of course call for help and get rush this person to the hospital as soon as possible now the principles of management that are going to be instituted in patients with burns so you want to first assess the severity and the admission criteria which we shall talk about we talked about assessing severity looking at the mild moderate severe and of course uh, looking also at also the percentage body surface area using the three methods the wallace rule of nines or rule of sevens the rule of palms as well as the london builder charts then of course you want to do your admission criteria you want to treat and prevent any shock that is present you want to treat and prevent any electrolyte imbalance any fluid imbalance you want to provide any um, analgesia you want to perform some wound care you want to treat and prevent any uh, wound infections so what is going to be our admission criteria generally patients that have a moderate to severe burns we admit patients that have airway burns any inhalational injury we admit any patients with um, burns that are in extremes of ages meaning that the very young and the very old you want to admit them any patients who have any electrical or deep chemical burns any patients that have burns that are going to be affecting the joints burns that are going to be affecting the face the perineum even any other multiple injury or fractures you want to admit them any psychiatric patients you want to admit them if there's also any suspicion of non-accidental injury of course you admit so you keep these things in mind because it's not all burns patients that we admit to the world some can actually be managed at home because the hospital really isn't a nice place to live in because they would pick up a lot of these nasty infections when they could have been treated at home when you're managing these burns patients you want to do your abcs so you want to check your airway to ensure that there is no respiratory compromise in cases of inhalational injury you ensure that this patient is breathing you may want to administer oxygen especially for patients that have uh, carbon monoxide poisoning 100 percent oxygen for 24 hours you want to gain venous access and actually get blood that you're going to be sending for the lab send blood for a cross match because this, this person may need the blood transfusion later on then 
you do not also want to transfuse blood on the first day because once you transfuse blood on the first day and the reactions that take place there may be some hemo hemo concentration the blood may become viscous in addition to this there may be some increase in vascular permeability because of the systemic inflammatory response so blood usually isn't given on the first day of a brain's patient but of course there is some arguments of different literature different physicians but for our case here, we do not give blood on the first day. Then you also want to catheterize the patient and monitor the urine output because this is going to be a good indicator of whether their kidneys are working and how much fluid they need. So you actually want a fluid input output chart. And of course your normal urine output would be 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg per hour. So what do I mean? If someone weighs 70 kg, so it means that in 70 in, in one hour, they should have produced 70 mils of urine. So that's why you need the urine bag to actually calculate this. And then keep this patient warm. Pretty much admit them to a burns unit. So it should be isolated. There should probably be a barrier nurse because no one should be allowed to enter in because of the risk of infections. Then they should be isolated as well. They should be sedated and there should be some proper analgesia. So you may give this patient morphine. You want to institute some fluids, which I'll talk about at length in the next coming slide. Then you want to monitor their vitals and their labs, daily wound cleaning, which I'll also talk about. And then you give them certain drugs, such as tetanus prophylaxis, the tetanus toxoid, about 0 0.5 mils international units, uh, a sing as a single dose. You may give them a proton pump inhibitor, so you may give them an, an omeprazole, maybe 20 milligrams um, twice a day or 40 milligrams once a day to prevent a curling salsa. Remember curling salsa are coming as a, as, a, as a result of this person being burnt, they go into hypovolemia, then the blood is diverted away from the gut, there's ischemia in the gut, and even the, the ulcerated areas in the gut, the blood cannot carry out the fluid that or the acid that leaks in and it causes um, ulceration of the gut lining. So you refer to that as a curling salsa. You also want to cover this patient on some antibiotics. So you want to also take a pus swab from the burn to see if you can culture anything from there. But generally, the drugs we use are penicillins, aminoglycosides, cephalosporins, even metronidazole. You want to put this patient on a high-protein diet because they need the proteins to repair the tissues. And of course, contemplate whether they require a skin graft or they do not require a skin graft. We'll talk about skin grafts on the skin chapter. Then when it comes to fluid therapy, remember that any patient that comes in with a burn that's greater than 10% in children and greater than 15% in adults or even severe burns, you want to give them IV fluids. The others could actually be given oral fluids, but with my experience, most patients that came in with uh, burns or that were severe enough to come to the hospital, we gave them IV fluids. So there are two regimens that we could use. There's what is known as the fluid replacement, um, which usually replaces the the, the losses that are lost during the burns, then there's what is known as the maintenance, which is what's going to be covering the insatiable losses. So in 24 hours, there's uh, an amount that you're supposed to give an individual, which we shall calculate in the next slide. So the principles of you giving these fluids, the first thing you have to remember is children over 10% and adults over 15% give them IV fluids, but in our setting, we give them IV fluids regardless. Then if... Um, they are given oral fluids then at least add some salt to the oral fluids then the fluids that you can give we calculate them using a formula which is known as a packland formula so the key thing is to balance the output with the input that's the key thing so please monitor your urine output so how do we calculate this fluid replacement so here's the formula you say the volume of the fluid that you're going to be instituting as resuscitation in the first um 24 hours four mils this is a constant multiplied by the mass of the child in kilograms multiplied by the burn percentage so the maximum that you can actually consider is 50 percent some literature or some authors actually go at 40 percent some people say 45 percent but the literature I was, I was quoting from usually um says a 50 percent so i'll give you an example suppose a child comes in with 25 percent burns and is weighing 20 kg how much um, fluid do they need mm -hmm. 
So in that scenario, if you got your answer as 2000, meaning four times 20 times 25, then you're indeed correct. So this child requires 2000 meals in 24 hours. So half of, half of this fluid that you calculate should be given in the first eight hours. So half of the 2000, so that means 1000 meals should be given in the first eight hours. And the other 1000 meals should be given in the remaining 16 hours. And take note that the time that you should be counting should be the time from which the child was burnt and not the time to which the ad, uh, the way admitted to the hospital or the time they came to the hospital suppose someone was burnt at 04 a.m this morning it means that the the counting of hours and if they reported four hours later if they reported at eight hours at the clinic they're going to be counting from 04 to eight hours meaning that they have already missed four hours so it means you would give that 1000 meals in four hours then the remaining should be given in 16 hours so, so from that time until 04 into the next day then it's very important also to keep um these weight formulas in your mind because sometimes on your exams they may not give you these formulas so if the child is less than one year old this is how you calculate the weight you say the age in months you add that to nine you divide the answer by two so for example if someone is eight months so it would be eight plus nine so that will give you 17 then 17 divided by 2 so there'll be approximately 8.5 kg then if someone is above a year old you say 2 multiplied by the age plus 4 so if someone is 8 years old you would say 8 plus 4 which gives you 12 12 times 2 which gives you 24 so this person would weigh 24 kilograms then how do we calculate the maintenance fluid so this is how we calculate maintenance fluid this is given usually in the next 24 hours so you say 100 mils per kg for the first 10 kg 50 mils per kg for the next 10 kg or the subsequent 10 kg and 20 mils for the uh, remaining 10 kg okay so for example i'll say a child that is 28 kg so we can divide this 28 into two tens and an eight so the first 10 kg you multiply it by a uh, thousand the next 10 kg you multiply it by 50 and whatever remains you multiply it by 20 so 10 times a thousand plus 10 times 50 plus 8 times 20 that gives you 1600 as the maintenance fluid and usually this maintenance fluid is five percent dextrose so dextrosaline so you give this over 24 hours because this child may also not be eating so well when it comes to wound healing um generally the, the debate is whether we should cover this wound with um, sterile or anti antibacterial dressing or just the simple dressing. So rule of thumb is this, with the full thickness burns, even with the dermal burns, you need an antibacterial dressing to actually delay colonization because this person may actually need surgery for a skin graft. And with the superficial burns, they, they will usually heal quickly and you don't need any antibacterial dressing, you just need a simple dressing. But what is very very important is the environment has to be clean because the environment will determine the outcome of this burn so it may actually worsen this or may actually lead to the burns actually healing very well so the different methods that we can use to clean the wounds we could have open method we could even have a closed method so in an open method this was with burns like for example on the face where you can't really uh, bandage the whole face or burns affecting the head or the neck so what we usually do is that we're going to clean the burns and then we'll apply the, the cream with the silver sulfur diazin, which is known as flamazin cream. Or with patients that are allergic to sulfur, we could substitute and use povidone cream or chlorhexidine cream. Then with a closed method, usually we want to clean the wounds and we'll apply a dressing that can actually soothe and actually protect the wound. In, in addition to this, it may actually reduce the pain and actually absorb some of the moisture from the wound or any pus although we do not want to close up a wound that has passed then usually we do this for like about uh, 10 days or sometimes we can use a mixed method where you clean the wound and you can even apply some wet socks if they slough in the wound you perform a sloughectomy which is removal of the slough if there's esca you can perform an esca escarotomy then as this patient is discharged of course teach them how to clean these wounds and advice to give patients or 
people may come to you with their children being burnt so the best advice you could give them is if the wound is superficial enough and doesn't require this person to be actually admitted to a hospital just advise them to wash it daily so use a plain soap life boy is very good one that's white in color so there are not so many additives that are there a plain white soap not too strong please do not use antiseptic soap soaps do not use salt in water do not use methylated spirit it tends to actually deepen the wound and then of course you can wash it with running water and then honey has also been seen to be antibacterial in nature and helps with soothing the wound and also helps with healing of the wound in some patients if the burn is affecting the joint they may require some rehabilitation of the joints so please involve the physiotherapists and then some people may also require some uh, um, skin grafts which may be auto uh, grafts meaning that they have a skin split skin graft where they take apart from their own skin and then graft it on to the burnt area the different complications in surgery can be divided into early complications intermediate complication and late complication so the early complications you could think of them systematically if you think of the respiratory system they could have some airway obstruction which can be caused by the pulmonary edema it can be caused by acute respiratory distress it could be caused by respiratory arrest even um, respiratory failure you could have some cardiovascular complications such as edema that is usually due to increased capillary permeability because of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome you could have some hypovolemia because you're losing water water in through the skin you're losing water through peripheral pooling of blood and increased vascular permeability you may also have hypoxia because the red blood cells are being damaged you may have shock also for the same reasons as um, hypoxia basically the systemic inflammatory response syndrome you may have toxic shock because bacteria uh, can actually enter into the blood because the barrier has been gotten rid of you may have hypothermia because the skin one of its function is to regulate temperature so please warm the fluids as you are administering them. When the genitourinary tract, you may have some electrolyte imbalances because of the kidneys being affected. You may even have shock. You may have some metabolic acidosis. You may even have some hypoglycemia, which is why we want to give you dextrocelline. Then some intermediate complications include wound infections. So the most commonly implicated organisms, especially in the hospital setup, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, beta hemolytic streptococcus, and Staph aureus. You could have some septicemia. This can complicate into septic arthritis. This person may develop stress ulcers. They may actually develop a bowel obstruction, which is referred to as a functional type of obstruction or paralytic ileus, especially with electrolyte imbalances. You may develop some compartment syndrome where the pressures increase, especially in eskers and in the limbs. You may have hypoproteinemia. You may have deep vein thrombosis because this patient may be immobile for some time. Then... Of course, you have some late complications such as contractures, which may be caused by fibrosis. So they may lead to ectropion, which is a complication affecting the eyelids. It may lead to microstomia affecting the mouth. It may lead to disabilities over different joints. You may have a defective hand function, even some growth retardation. You may have hypertrophic scars or keloids, which I'll do this when you look at wounds and wound healing. Then we may have Magellan's ulcers, which is malignant transformation. You may have some nerve compression. And of course, long-term effect is that you're going to have some psychological effect because of cosmesis. You won't ever look the same because of a scar. And some people have actually um, gone into depression. So please also get to counsel these patients, talk to them and help them understand their condition. The prognosis of the condition largely depends on the percentage and the age of the patient. So if you want to actually calculate the percentage mortality, you say the age of the patient plus the percentage um, burn surface area. And if there is inhalation or injury, this greatly increases the mortality. But as to how much, we're not really sure about that. So with that said in mind, from MK Medical Review Series, until next time, thank you for listening to this review lecture video on birds. Have a good day. Bye-bye.